factor. So this is the lower GI part. So we'll just get straight into it. Um, any problems? Just let me know. OK, so the recording started. Great. So there's not too much to this section. I think Bolin will cover a bit more in the sort of surgery side of it. Um, but what we'll do is I'm going to go over through lower GI bleeding. So um, not the management for upper, more chronic situations. I'm just going to simply sort of highlight to you how you might differentiate between these and sort of SBA points. Um, so I'll go over celiac disease as well, um, cover some of the niche areas in there. Um, and then inflammatory bowel disease, so we're going through Crohn's and UC. And then bowel cancer is something that comes up every year. Um, so we'll be going through how it presents, screening, referrals. Um, I won't talk too much about the different types, like the hereditary ones, and we'll go through the management briefly. Um, right, so we'll crack on. So we've got first SBA here for you. Okay, nice. So vast majority of you getting this right. So we'll just break this down a bit. So we've got an elderly gentleman presenting with blood in his stool. It's a fresh red colour mixed in with the stool. He's got feeling of needing to go to the toilet but unable to pass anything. So this sensation is sometimes described as genesmus or the fact that you go to the toilet and there's a incomplete, you know, you feel like you haven't passed everything. Um, He's got a past medical history of hypertension and atrial fibrillation, and they're managed accordingly. So breaking that down, this would point more towards colorectal cancer. Um, so drug-related bleeding is incorrect because whilst he is on blood thinning medication, this wouldn't explain the weight loss. Did I mention weight loss in this then? Okay, sorry, I must have uh, alluded to that there, but that was meant to be in to help you narrow that down. So weight loss is an indicative sign um, of colorectal cancer. Um, UC, so UC does have a bimodal age distribution um, and also has this tenesmus sensation as a presenting feature, but you would expect sort of a mucus passage as well. Also, uh, they might have a history of increased frequency. Um, diverticulitis, so actually PR bleeding is quite a rare and it's not, it's not a common feature in, in diverticulitis. Um, you'd expect more abdominal pain and bloating alongside some systemic upset. And hemorrhoids, you'd expect more fresh uh, bleeding, filling the, uh, fill the pan and on, the, on, uh, on wiping. You'd expect more of a profuse bleed, basically. So this is colorectal cancer. Um, so I'll just mention um, colorectal cancer does come up um, a lot in SBAs, especially the management, like the two-week weight referral. So you are definitely expected to sort of recognise this given his age and the sort of sinister symptoms, um, you, would, you would be warranting a two-week weight referral, basically. And also, they like to um, do this as a history station. I think we've had to do it twice. So more than likely, it might come up for you guys. So it's just sort of important to be aware and what sort of questions you want to ask. Um, but we'll just move on to sort of how a patient might present. So, um, you know, lower GI bleeding could be quite an old, uh, old person saying, you know, I'm feeling a bit tired lately, getting a bit out of breath, um, mentioned some weight loss. But apart from that, it's a bit unremarkable history. So that's because, you know, lower GI bleeding can be a microscopic. You don't necessarily see it. So this patient's potentially presenting with anemia, um, given the fact that he's feeling so tired and his, and his exercise tolerance has gone down. Whereas you could get someone a lot younger, like patients sort of our age, um, and they notice a lot of blood, fresh red blood, um, 
all over the toilet and the, on the toilet paper. And this can be quite scary for some patients. Um, you know, seeing quite a fresh bleed can be quite concerning. However, that's just sort of a benign hemorrhoid picture. Whereas on the other, on the other hand, you might have a, a sinister cancer diagnosis. So um, why is this important? So it's just sort of helpful to um, narrow your differentials, especially when it comes to upper GI versus lower GI bleeding and sort of anal bleeding as well, which I think Ed will talk about later. Um, and also can guide your management. So I've, I've sort of given you the generic sort of pictures and conditions that you might get. Um, but basically, blood in the colon is a, it sort of has a laxative effect and it's rarely retained long enough for, um, so like how um, upper GI bleed, you get like this dark melina, whereas in the in the lower GI tract, that doesn't occur because it passes a lot quicker and there's no um, uh, digestive enzymes in the, col in, the, in, the, in the colon, whereas they are in the small bowel. So that's why you don't get that melina effect. But as a general rule, so right-sided lower GI bleed, can still be a bit darker than the left-sided ones um, and bleeding from the colon is usually um, more mixed in with the stool whereas bleeding at or just above the level of the anus can cause this bright red blood and sort of coats the stool uh, and you can see it on the tissue paper and into the toilet bowl. Um, so it's just sort of helpful in the clinical history to try and localise the anatomical source. Um, as I've said bright red blood is more rectal or anal canal in origin and um, dark dark red blood still suggests a more proximally sighted bleeding source. And as I mentioned, blood that's in the upper GI tract um, will typically present with this melina sort of picture. So in terms of management of lower GI bleeding, assuming you've taken a, a thorough sort of history, um, there are things that you sort of must do. So you need to check the patient isn't in any shock. Um, because if you're in a GP setting, you sort of want to get these patients sent to hospital sort of ASAP. Um, they can still present, you know, hemodynamically compromised. Um, you must do a PR exam to try and visualise any site of bleeding, any hemorrhoids. Um, and also you don't want to assume um, that, you know, someone hasn't or has not had a, a PR bleed. Um, just based on their history alone, you want to check for yourself, you might get some blood on the stool. FBC is important to check for any anemia. As we mentioned, the 65-year-old gentleman presenting with breathlessness and uh, fatigue uh, could be a sort of sign of anemia due to this GI bleed. Um, and also anemia is uh, blood loss until proven otherwise uh, in a sort of elderly patient. Um, you need to ensure that um, it's not a cancer that's causing this. Um, Anything else? And then endoscopy as well to rule out any malignancy. Um, basically any, as I've just sort of alluded to, <clears throat> any any elderly male or postmenopausal female who have an unexplained IDA, iron deficiency anemia, should be considered for further GI investigations. Um, I think I've got this summarised uh, on the slide. Yeah, I've got it summarised on the slide there for you. Um, yep, okay. So in sort of young patients as well, um, just to sort of be aware, if there's no concerning features in the history, um, you can do sigmoidoscopy just to demonstrate that there isn't anything else and it's just hem like a hemorrhoid disease. Um, I think, yeah, that's basically it. Um, also um, in younger patients presenting with features of like altered bowel habit, um, you might have a suspicion of inflammatory bowel disease and you can do colonoscopy for that, but we'll talk about that later. So sort of take home points from lower GI bleeding. Um, blood loss from the lower GI tract could present in many different ways. Anemia in an adult is blood loss until proven otherwise. And you always want to sort of rule out cancer and get an endoscopy done. So move on to the next SBA.
yeah okay nice so the vast majority of you got this right so this is a sort of um classic presentation <clears throat> of celiac disease so this is sort of those two-step questions so the correct answer here is uh duodenal sasgeginal biopsy this is the gold standard diagnostic investigation a lot of you put d so anti-ttg antibodies yeah they're the first line and main uh antibody that you look for but they can um not necessarily be that specific and they're affected by total iga levels as well i think this question does come up they like to get you with the gold standard investigation so just something to be aware of so how might a patient present um with celiac disease um so typically it's um a younger patient um the the mother is saying that um all the friends are outgrowing her so basically failure to thrive um so she's feeling tired she's probably not um she's probably malnourished and she's got some abdominal pain and she feels sick most of the time so this is probably due to the fact that she's eating uh, foods with gluten in that are upsetting her and also you get the the altered bowel habits of diarrhea um and the mother herself also has graves disease so celiac disease is an autoimmune condition uh, as i've mentioned its sensitivity to protein and gluten um <clears throat> affects around 1% of the population, so relatively common. Um, and then this repeat, the repeated exposure to the gluten causes villus atrophy, which in turn causes uh, malabsorption. So um, I won't sort of read these out to you, but as I've mentioned, uh, it's related to other autoimmune conditions and the classic signs and symptoms are sort of what I've explained in the stem of that SBA. Um, but what I will go on to talk about is sort of investigations and the key points. So um, the the issue is, so one of the things that you have to be aware of, uh, if patients are already taking a gluten-free diet, then it's a bit cruel, but you should sort of ask them to reintroduce it to the diet for at least six weeks prior to testing. Um, and then patients get this, um, um, they have that serological testing. Um, so as I've sort of mentioned, uh, it's combined with the the duodenal slash jejunal biopsy. Um, so patients should be referred um, after posit positive serological testing. Um, ideally, this should be carried out uh, before gluten is withdrawn. And then you can see on histology, um, because they like to throw in these buzzwords sometimes, and you might get a picture of this. I should have included one, actually. Um, but you get subtotal villus uh, atrophy, crypt type to hyperplasia and intraepithelial lymphocytes um, and as I've sort of mentioned uh, TGA, TTGA, TTG IGA antibodies are first choice um, <coughs> but you must measure IGA as well because um, some patients can have an IGA deficiency um, and as I sort of mentioned in the SBA the anti-endomesial and anti gliding are not recognized by NICE um, and just to sort of remember, keep in mind, gold standard is uh, the, the biopsy. Uh, sort of extra exam points that get thrown in. I mentioned it in the stem of that SBA, um, the dermatitis hepatiformis. So this is this vesicular rash that you can get. I've included some pictures there for you. Um, it's treated with Dapsone. No, it's sort of a niche point, um, but they, you know, they like to ask these sort of questions um functional hypersplenism so uh, basically um the the splenic tissue uh, is present but it doesn't work particularly well um it's just basically a form of immunodeficiency as i'm sure you're aware i think you'd get taught about it with like sickle cell patients as well <coughs> excuse me um basically yeah they get uh reduced immunity so just points to be aware of, they get offered pneumococcal vaccine and annual influenza, annual influenza vaccine. Um, and then also anemia. So um, they can get also, they can get any sort of anemia. So uh, deficiencies in iron, folate and vitamin B12, but folate is the most common. And this dude, I'm just feeling ill bro, is sort of like a way to remember which is absorbed in which part. So duodenum is duodenum is uh, iron, so dude I'm, and then just feeling, so jejunum folate, and then ill bro is ileum B12. 
I found that quite helpful in remembering where uh, each one is absorbed. Um, but yeah, just something to be aware of. These can get uh, thrown in the exams, especially dermatitis hepatiformis. So just be aware of it. So take home points from celiac disease. It's associated with other immune conditions. The first line investigation is the TTG antibodies, but the gold standard is a biopsy. <coughs> And then functional hyperspinism and dermatitis hypothalamus, just these extra manifestations to be aware of. OK, so move on to the next SBA. Okay, nice. So the majority of you are getting this right. Um, so basically, this patient has um, a severe flare-up of their Crohn's, basically, uh, of, of ulcerative colitis, sorry. Um, this question will come up. It's come up in our fourth year and our final year. Uh, basically, you need to be able to recognise um, when patients have got severe flare-ups of Crohn's. Uh, Crohn's or UC, to be honest, uh, but the, they usually do uh, ulcerative colitis because they've got the true love and wits. So seven bloody motions a day, compromises uh, severe. Also the fact they're tachycardic, pyrexic and have a high CRP. Basically, you, you don't really need to know the, the, the scoring systems. You can sort of appreciate that this patient is very unwell. Um, and the fact that she's already on um, some daily treatment and this is still not helped sort of indicates that they might need um, hospitali hospitalization. Um, but yeah, this question will more than likely come up and the answer is admit for, admit for, high, admit for IV hydrocortisone or IV steroid basically. So you definitely need to be aware of this. Um, there's a lot of steps and nuances in the sort of management of inflammatory bowel disease, but genuinely this is the most important thing that you need to know. Um, but we'll just sort of move on. I'll talk about the management a bit later. Um, so how might inflammatory bowel disease present? So you could have a 24 year old man comes into clinic, got diarrhea, abdominal pain. This has been going on for a year. He's lost some weight. He's not fe he's feeling quite tired. Um, it sort of can be better or worse. Um, and when it feels like he's worse, he gets a red eye. So you get these uh, extra intestinal manifestations in inflammatory bowel disease. So this is anterior uveitis. Uh, and he's also got some skin tags, um, other extra intestinal manifestations, which we'll talk about. Or you could have an elderly gentleman. So remember that, uh, especially UC as well, it has a bimodal age distribution. So you can present in your like teens or 20s or in your 50s or 60s. Um, so this is more likely to be UC. He's got diarrhea, left-sided abdominal pain. Um, this has been going on for at least a year, but it's suddenly gotten worse. Bloody diarrhea as well is more indicative of UC. Um, and also increased frequency as well and, pass it, and passing mucus. Um, strange marks on the shins. This is erythema nodosum. And he also gets this sort of anterior uveitis uh, 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 inflammation of the eye. So these diseases can present um, differently. Um, it's sort of useful to be able to tease out the, the differences between them. Um, so I'm going to go through this now. Um, but these are the really crappy things that you have to sort of just learn. Um, but these questions come up and they'll give you a stem and then say um, which one is most likely to be part of which. 
So we'll practice some of those now. Um, I just feel like you've um, got to just learn. There's the tables on PassMed and QuesMed about the differences. They might ask you differences uh, in terms of uh, histology, what you might see on uh, examination, so like extra intestinal manifestations, or even what you might find on examination. So I, I, I've not included this as a revision tool, but I'm telling you that this is what you need to do, but we'll practice some questions. So this is like similar to what you might get, basically. OK, nice. So yeah, basically this one, colostone appearance is Crohn's. The others are all UC, so it's good that you've recognised that. Um, so you guys have obviously learned and gone through this before. We'll just practice another one. OK, nice. Yeah, so same again. The vast majority of you getting this right. These are a little bit easier than the ones that I remember. Um, one thing I'll sort of warn you about is they, they throw in weird terms that I think basically mean the same things, but you might not be familiar with. So I would encourage you to just do a little bit of extra reading around what these these terms might have different names. So I'm sorry, I couldn't remember exactly, so I didn't want to put anything wrong that was in there. But these are the sort of type of questions that you might get and they definitely will come up. So it's just something to sort of keep in mind and go over and make sure you can, you know, you learn. It's one of those things you've just got to wrote, learn, maybe do some flashcards on it, but it's, it's definitely worthwhile going over. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this picture before. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, I, won't, I won't sort of, you know, go through this all now. Um, but I would encourage you to go away in your own time and just make sure you learn the these sort of differences because it's very pertinent to your exams. Um, as I've mentioned in the in the stems of those SBAs and um, getting the differences in how they might present. <clears throat> um, but in terms of investigations, so um, basically your sort of basic blood tests. So. Uh, you might get raised white cell count, raised ESR, CRP, because obviously it's inflammation. Um, <coughs> you might see an anemia, secondary to chronic inflammation, low albumin, that can be secondary to malabsorption. Uh, one thing that's important is a stool culture or a fecal cow protecting, basically. Um, you, you, so this helps distinguish from irritable bowel syndrome um, because uh, fecal cow protectin um, it's an antigen produced by neutrophils uh, and this will be raised in inflammatory bowel disease and not in irritable bowel syndrome basically. Um, and then ultimately you'll need to do an endoscopy with imaging is required for diagnosis. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> um, for um, UC, uh, for Crohn's disease as well on colonoscopy, I've sort of mentioned the cobblestone mucosa, you might get skip lesions, rose thorn ulcers, um, and then also you can use MRI to check for small bowel involvement with um, with uh, Crohn's disease. Um, you can do things like um, the capsule endoscopy as well, um, but out of your remit, it's a bit more specialised. Just sort of be aware of the 
sort of basic stepwise progression stuff that I've just mentioned. Um, and then sort of it's sort of the same investigations for ulcerative colitis as well. Um, you'd expect to see maybe an anemia, white uh, raised white cell count, ESR, CRP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you want to do your fecal carprotectin again. Um, and then when you sort of get to the, the uh, colonoscopy stage, you, you see this continuous inflammation as well, um, loss of household markings, pseudo polyps, et cetera. And I've mentioned on biopsy, you'll see, you can do biopsy as well, see um, loss of goblet cells, crypt uh, abscesses. Um, and you can do bare minimums as well, which will show like, loss of household markings. Um, one thing to be aware of though, um, in the acute setting, so if someone's coming in quite unwell, um, you know, like as I mentioned, a severe a flare, um, things like colonoscopy and barium enemas are on, uh, contraindicated due to the risk of uh, bowel perforation, so you wouldn't want to be doing those. Uh, CT uh, is more suitable in this setting. Also like abdominal x-ray, and chest uh, an erect chest x-ray is something you want to do to exclude like toxic megacolon or any perforation um so the management um so this is the 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 true love and whips criteria that i was sort of mentioning earlier but i wouldn't i'd i i'd never particularly like wrote learned this diagram and knew the difference between mild moderate and severe just know that what's severe basically um because that will come up. And as you can see, like, you know, if someone's passing more than six blood emotions a day, they're tachycardic, they've got high temperature, you know, they're anemic, and all their inflammatory markers are raised, then you know this person's going to be quite unwell. Um, so I'll just quick briefly talk about the different drug names because I used to get quite confused with these. Um, so um, the five amino um, sali, uh, salic acids, so five SA, five ASAs. Um, these are sort of these are a drug that are released in the colon and then they're not absorbed. So it acts locally as an anti-inflammatory. Um, they don't understand how it works fully, but they think it like inhibits prostaglandin synthesis. Um, and these are the, like some of the names that you might see. So sulfasalazine, mesalazine. Um, so they're sort of the names that you want to be aware of. Azathioprine is, um, there's some interesting things that you should know about. So um, it's, I w don't get too bogged down on how they work and the, the, the paths and stuff, but basically it's me metabolized to an active form. Um, and you have to measure this enzyme called TPMT, so thyropurine methyl transferase. Um, you may have heard of that, um, but basically some people have a, a lower level of this enzyme and this is the enzyme that sort of metabolizes these um, drugs and it can make them prone to toxicity. Um, as I mentioned in the rheumatology lecture, these sort of drugs have um, adverse effects like bone marrow, toxicity, um, and they can cause other things like nausea, vomiting, pancreatitis, etc. Um, another thing to be aware of with regards to this uh, TPMT is um, these drugs can have a reaction, so azathioprine can have a reaction with allopurinol um, because they're sort um, they allopurinol um, can increase the amount of azathioprine basically, and um, it can just create this toxicity. So a lower dose should be used. Um, very sort of niche points. I'd be giving that sort of like a red uh, light on the traffic light thing as in it's not very clinically useful for you guys because it would be very specialist, but it may come up in an SBA, so just something to be aware of. Uh, infliximab is the anti-TNF. They're sort of getting a lot later down the line in management. Um, I wouldn't be too worried about knowing when you'd use that, but just a little uh, factor to remember is that it can reactivate TB. Um, and then... Um, yeah, cyclosporin, you're getting a lot further down. Um, yeah, they're the sort of drug names. Uh, the aminosalicylates, as I've sort of explained, and azathioprine are maybe what you should know a bit more about. But inducing remission, so um, we'll talk about 
this for ulcerative colitis. As I sort of mentioned earlier, I wouldn't get too bogged down on this. Just know the drugs that I used um, and I'd make just make sure you definitely know about the severe uh, flare ups. But I'll go for it for you now anyway. So inducing remission in a, a mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, you can use topical, so rectal amino salicylates. Um, so typically for like distal colitis, uh, rectal mesalazine might be used. Um, if remission is not achieved with that, then you sort of add an oral amino salicylate. And then if that's still not working, then you can think about adding topical or oral steroids. Um, if it's sort of a bit more uh, further up, so it's like left-sided UC, um, you can still use topical so rectal amino salicylates, um, and then it sort of follows the um, same sort of pathway. Um, you add in oral um, oral treatments, then add in oral steroids. Uh, but if the disease is quite extensive, um, you want to give rectal and oral at the same time, uh, and then you follow the same sort of progression. So add in the steroids later on. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Just sort of be aware. You start rectal, uh, so like local first, and then you add on oral, and then add on oral steroids. Um, this is the main thing. So um, in acute severe disease, treated in hospital, you give them IV corticosteroids. If that's contraindicated or not tolerated, then you give intravenous cyclosporin. Um, if they don't improve on steroids alone, then you add on uh, cyclosporin or an anti-TNF infliximab. And potentially surgery uh, may be needed if these patients get toxic megacolon um, or their just symptoms aren't improving at all. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the sort of beyond the admitting and IV steroids. Um, you definitely need to know that. I keep hammering that home because it is very important. Um, cool. Fine. Uh, cyclosporin as well, I've mentioned it a few times. It's an immunosuppressant. Um, it's one of these that messes around with like interleukins and all that stuff. Um, you guys probably know more than, about it than me. Um, but just to be aware, it's another immunosuppressant. Um, so... Maintaining remission um, in these patients, um, as we said in the stem, that that, that lady was on topical uh, amino salicylates daily. Um, if that doesn't work, you can add oral. I won't labour this point too much. You can you can have a look at this in your own time, but it's sort of the same thing as inducing the remission. Um, and then, so as I mentioned in the, some of the drugs earlier, if if um, they keep relapsing or having severe exacerbations, you can add in or you can put them on, sorry, oral azathioprine. Um, that was one of the drugs that I mentioned earlier, but it's probably way out of your remit. It's very specialised. Just be aware of what, what, is, what happens, basically. Um, so with Crohn's, um, inducing remission. Um, so... Um, medical management to induce remission. Patients should be offered monotherapy, so with uh, IV uh, steroids, either PRED or hydrocortisone. Um, a is a fireprint. Um, so the amino salis, the management's slightly different. Um, a is a fireprint or meta, um, mericaptiprin uh, may be added on to induce remission if there are two or more exacerbations in 12 month period and the steroids can't be tapered. Um, methotrexate can be added on in Crohn's as well, um, but it's not. So there was another difference as well. Methotrexate is more useful in Crohn's than it is in for uh, for UC. Um, basically, it, um, like I said, don't get too bogged down on all these fancy drugs and the different uh, you know different types and when they get added on. Just remember the sort of uh, emergency management. Um, so then sort of maintaining remission in these patients, you don't use the amino salicylates, um, you get on azathioprine straight away, then methotrexate, and then they get on anti-TNFs a lot quicker. 
Um, also, stopping smoking. Uh, so, some of you may know that smoking actually helps with uh, ulcerative colitis, um, whereas smoking makes Crohn's a lot worse. Um, but yeah, um, drug treatment for maintaining remission in Crohn's is azathioprine. Um, methotrexate can be added second line, and then um, the anti TNS can be used uh, if it works for patients and it's not and the, they've not been um, not being uh, managed on the azathioprine or methotrexate. Um, surgical management as well. Um, I'll sort of mention. In UC, it can be curative because it only affects the, uh, the, the the colon. So if you remove it, then they shouldn't get any more uh, flare-ups. Whereas surgical management in Crohn's, because it can happen anywhere from mouth to anus, isn't curative. Um, they only sort of do it if there's been like stricture formation and it's causing like obstructions and stuff. But basically the take-home points for this are um, management is split into inducing remission, and maintaining remission. Patients tending with an acute inflammatory bowel need IV hydrocortisone. Rectal symptoms predominantly in UC, you give uh, the amino salicylates. Steroids and amino salicylates are better for UC. Azathioprine is used for maintaining remissions in Crohn's. And there's no uh, role for methotrexate in UC, basically. And also just learn the differences. I think the differences between the two are the main thing you guys need to learn. But anyway, we'll move on now. So next SBA. Okay, nice. Well done, everyone. <clears throat> so, as I've mentioned, uh, this is also a very important thing, uh, recognizing uh, potential bowel cancer and um, two-week wait, basically. Uh, so, this man is uh, over the sort of 55 years of age, six months history, he's got weight loss, and he's had a change in bowel habit. So, this is basically warranting uh, urgent colonoscopy. Um, <clears throat> I won't labor the point too much. Um, so one thing I just wanted to sort of emphasize here is that 95% of the cancers are sporadic and not down to these fancy genetic syndromes. Um, so I wouldn't focus too much on learning all of those. I don't think they ever came up. Um, and I'm not going to talk about risk factors and stuff. You guys are, you know, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. Um, but what I will sort of talk about is the screening programs. So um, you've got the FIT test and the one-off uh, sigmoidoscopy. So sometimes in OSCEs they might actually talk about uh, FIT testing and screening. Um, so I sort of just, you know, be aware of different types of screening programs. Um, basically, the good thing about this FIT test is that um, it only detects human hemoglobin, whereas the old one, the, the fecal occult blood uh, one, Oh, it, it detected uh, animal hemoglobin too. So if you ate like a steak the day before, you might have a positive um, uh, test in that case. Um, and then the one-off flexible sigmoidoscopy is sort of offered to uh, patients, uh, I think when they're 55, to just look for any polyps basically, and they can, they can remove them at that stage before they're cancerous. Um, and then sometimes it may even pick up a cancer. Um, so this is basically what I've just sort of said. Um, that's just a bit of summary of it. And then same again here, uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy screening. So yeah, it's 55 years old. Um, and then um, they can sort of, if they don't have one at 55, they can uh, sort of refer themselves before the age of 60. 
Um, so the two week wait criteria, um, so it's sort of based on age and clinical symptoms. Um, but I think realistically there's a very low threshold for it. If you see an answer where it's sort of any sort of uh, change in bowel habit, older patient, and the answer is urgent two week wait referral, I guarantee it will be the correct answer. Um, in general, if it's sort of unexplained rectal or abdominal mass, um, or any, un any unexplained rectal breeding, you want to be referring them for uh, an urgent uh, colonoscopy. Um, but yeah, I won't sort of read through these. They're there for you to look at. Um, but you definitely, definitely should be aware of these. Um, quickly go through the sort of diagnostic workup. So um, this came up in uh, Aroski. And we had to take a history. And one thing I've not mentioned here, which I sort of got told off, told off for um, in my OSCE feedback, was that despite the fact that we had to counsel this patient on um, his potential diagnosis, it's important to talk about the tests. So colonoscopy obviously is very important, but you also want to do uh, full blood counts as well to check for any sort of anemia, for example. So don't forget the sort of the basic tests as well. But Given that um, they, they they most likely have it, so you get colonoscopy. So they look for uh, any obvious polyps or tumours, take any biopsies, uh, remove any suspicious looking lumps if they can. Um, then you want to be doing CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis for staging, and then a PET scan as well to check for any distal mets. Um, so staging, a lot of people get really bogged down and stressed out about this um, and treatments as well. So this is basically what sort of you need to know. Um, Duke staging, yeah, I think learn different. So A, B, C, D, uh, but the tumor node metastasis one, I wouldn't get too bogged down on, um, you know, what it means and how it alters treatment. but. Um, they inform about prognosis and treatment plan is what's important for you. So in terms of management, what I'd say is if you know you've got like a, a stage A or a T1, M0, N0, you know that that could be potentially curative, so that'd be surgery. Whereas if they've got METs and a quite an invasive tumour, you may need some surgery alongside some systemic chemotherapy. Um, so don't get too bogged down on specific chemotherapies, specific surgeries, what each tumour node metastases stage means. I think I've summarised it next. Yeah, basically um, a T1, N0 and M0 is, is good, curative, surgery only, whereas T4, N1 and M1, you know that's bad. They're going to potentially need some chemotherapy additionally to that. That's basically all you sort of need to know. So that sort of finishes the presentation. Um, sorry, it's been a bit longer than I, I initially said. Um, but Ed's going to take over and sort of do the surgery side of it now. I'll have a look at the chat, see if there's any questions and stuff, and I can clarify while Ed's doing his bit of the lecture. But thanks a lot for listening. Um, any other questions, just give me a shout. Ed, are you all right to do your bit? Should we do a little break? Yeah, I'm just running the poll now and see what they want. Most people are saying carry on. Cool. Um, right. I'll stop presenting uh, and mute myself, etc. Are you? Um, are you? I'm just trying to clear this poll. Are you on the VVox? Um, I got Shwet here as well. Shwet's here. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely. Um, yeah, um, no more for Lexi Sig 55 year olds got scrapped this year. Wow, nice. Did not know that. No, I didn't too far. All right, I'll have a little peruse through this. I've seen you guys have uh, handled it quite well, but if there's anything else, I can have a quick look. The only thing we weren't sure about, um, why do you get low albumin in ulcerative colitis? Do you know? Um, I just thought it was due to sort of malabsorption. And also, I guess UC could... 
Yeah, if you're not if you're not getting enough, uh, you know, you can get uh, you're just basically sort of malnourished, I guess. And then albumin over a long sort of time goes down. It's quite indicative of uh, uh, malnutrition. Basically, it's one of the first things that sort of goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, my thing is messing up again like it was last time. So let me get my PowerPoint open. We had this with the fifth years where. So usually when you present on here, you get a little slide at the bottom that shows all the upcoming slides and little notes that you've got and whatever that you write in the subsection on PowerPoint and they're not showing. So let me... Maybe you need to like update the app or something. Yeah, I'm using it on the browser. Um, but yeah, I really like, you've kind of, you've taken the weight off my shoulders. You've covered a lot of what I was going to, or like what comes up in Gen Surge. Um, so let's have a little look. Yeah, so if we look to, towards the right, acute abdomen and appendicitis, I think, are so vanilla. There's not really much need to do them. Colorectal cancer, Isaac's just done. Pancreatitis. Um, Westwood did it towards halfway through the last section. He did it at the end of his um, liver, pancreas, biliary system stuff. And hernias and bowel ischemia, I think... They are important, but they're straightforward-ish. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't really want to talk through them. Whereas I think these things on the left, basically all the, the bum disease is kind of, it's easier to get mixed up with. So I'll try and kind of clear up the things for you. Because we never got taught about bum disease in, in fourth year, and then we got a question on it. Um, so I thought it'd be useful to go through that with you guys. Although, as you said, they're using med student council or med school council questions. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, I've included this. Th these are uh, nicked off the curriculum map. Um, if you look at the top one, they like to talk about the surgery and complications of, of diverticular disease. So we'll get into that a little bit, um, even though I think it's a bit niche. But whatever, quick recap of that. It's not easy, difficult, hard. It relates to whether the condition we're talking about is common or, or dangerous. Um, we haven't got any red lights in this one, but we've got a couple of ambers and some greens. So we'll do the first question. Let me set the poll off. And I'll give you a minute or so to do this one. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Interestingly, um, a lot of you have gone for hemorrhoids. Now, we will come to hemorrhoids later. What I was thinking this was, was more uh, diverticular disease. So we've got an older guy, 75, um, with a relatively ac acute history. So it'll talk about a recent change in bowel habit. Um, and then it'll talk about a PR bleed. And the abdominal pain, I would say, is the key sort of distinguishing factor between this and hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids tend to be painless. Um, I could have been more specific about the nature of the blood. So as Isaac was, was saying earlier, like the closer you are to the anus, the fresher the blood will be. Um, so a hemorrhoid would be, I would say, because it's so close to, to, to the anus, it would be fresh blood. Whereas with diverticular disease, it might be blood on the stool rather than as two discrete kind of outputs from, from the back passage. Um, so we'll have a quick recap of the causes of PR bleeding. Obviously colorectal cancer and inflammatory bowel disease we've had uh, covered nicely here. And then these three blue ones, diverticular disease we'll do first, and then we'll go on to hemorrhoids and other anorectal diseases. Um, I want to clear up a bit of terminology because I found it quite confusing. So a diverticulum uh, is presumably from Latin. It means a herniation or an outpouching of the gastrointestinal mucosa. 
and you can see in the picture there um it's just like it looks like a little antenna coming out the side or something and then diverticulosis describes the process of diverticulum or diverticuli forming diverticular disease is when you have diverticuli um that cause problems so they can be there and be harmless or they can be there and cause pain constipation and that's when you would consider it a disease and if they get infected like if you have uh, feces that gets inside and kind of stagnates and fosters infection you can have diverticulitis um, similar in the way you get appendicitis where you can have feces kind of come off it, it should be passing through the bowel constantly whereas it can go and get stuck in the appendix which kind of comes off the side of the bowel and get infected in there so it's a similar thing um, so yeah how do they present so we want to think about diverticular disease and diverticulitis the guy in the question had diverticular disease so he had a change in bowel habit with pain i would say nine times out of ten if they're talking about the pain of diverticular disease in an sba they'll call it left-sided or lower left-sided because that relates to where in the colon the pain is coming from um, nausea and flatulence they're fairly non-specific um, fairly non-specific symptoms uh, and rectal bleeding obviously and, and relieved by defecation that's because the out pouchings in the in the wall of the, the bowel are kind of worsened by things being in there um, so feces can stretch it can cause uh, pushing forces on the walls so basically if you, if you empty your rectum if you go to the toilet you can relieve the pain mm -hmm. so diverticulitis because it's such a similar condition it presents very much the same um, but you can have fever I would say fever is like the key uh, distinguishing factor that you want to look out for um, and so the management or the investigation of the management depends on the severity in most instances people will go to their GP with kind of non-acute presentations i.e they're not that unwell it's maybe been going on for a while um, and the GP can order full blood count so you can rule out um, anemia which might point you more towards uh, cancer um, and you want to check white cells as well so if you've got high white cells you've maybe got an inflammatory process on you may be leaning more towards diverticulitis but yeah generally um, you manage this kind of thing conservatively if you can so bowel rest is kind of reducing your oral intake and you can improve your fiber intake to help the passage of feces through simple analgesia like paracetamol you know just to help with the pain um, do I think it's worth you learning these drugs that I've listed here yeah, if you can be bothered. So mebevirin is an antispasmodic that will work as an analgesic by kind of relaxing the muscle of the bowel. And I'm not sure if these are still in vogue, these antibiotics I've listed here, but it's worth knowing. I mean, it, it seems obvious that for diverticulitis, i.e. inflammation and infection of the bowel, you will give antibiotics. Um, I say it's more worthwhile knowing the principles rather than knowing the specific drugs here. But then a severe attack, so what distinguishes severe diverticulitis or diverticular disease from a non-severe case is kind of systemic unwellness, the degree of pain and whether there are complications or whether there are suspected complications. So we'll get onto those on the next slide, kind of how uh, diverticular dis disease can cause more problems kind of beyond just itself. Um, so CT abdomen is your gold standard diagnostic investigation. Um, and the things that will be offered in secondary care that the GP can't offer are basically IV therapies. So we're talking about bowel rest um, in the community. In the hospital setting, that means going nil by mouth, um, being put onto IV fluids, IV antibiotics. And whether you go for surgery with this depends on complications. So let's have a look at what they are. Um, these are listed on NICE. I think if you guys look at the slides later on, I've put a link down in the little kind of area under the slide to where nice talk about this so let's go to the top one perforation if you have an outpouching in the in the wall of the bowel it's going to be thinned and weakened and it's going to be able a lower quality structure and basically if it gets to the point of bursting then you're going to pass feces into the the abdomen into the free space and that can cause uh, ileus which is kind of it's not paralysis of the bowel but the bowel stops moving altogether as though it were paralyzed um, and that will cause worsening constipation and what have you peritonitis so that's infection inflammation of the peritoneum which is um i don't know exactly what it is it's a kind of a weird connective tissue layer in the abdomen that kind of goes around the organs but is also a separate structure in, a, in and of itself um, and peritonitis presents with a rigid or woody abdomen basically 
the patient won't let you go anywhere near the tummy. They're really kind of too scared to move because it hurts. And shock is like high, uh, high heart rate, low blood pressure. Um, and I've mentioned there a Hartman's procedure as being the management of that. We'll get onto exactly what a Hartman's procedure is in a couple of slides. But basically, a perforation is very much an emergency setting. And so that warrants emergency surgery, which is what Hartman's is. But let's go through the other complications first. Obstruction, um, you all know what obstruction is. An abscess, so that's uh, a fluid collection with, that is infected um, and that can form in where there was a diverticulum. And abscess is classically called swinging fever. So your temperature goes up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, leukocytosis just means high white cell count. And you manage that with antibiotics to treat the infection and you want to drain the, the fluid collection, otherwise it won't really resolve. Um, hemorrhage, I'm not going to talk about too much. You, you, you know, you can just lose blood from, from one of these. And, and fistulation, we had a question, I believe, in, I can't remember if it was the year six exam, I think it was, um, about fistulation. That's the formation of a fistula. So you can have enterocolic, which is, I think, small bowel to large bowel um or potentially large bowel to the outside world the other two are worth knowing about definitely so colovaginal is pretty grim you can basically have a passage from the colon to the vagina and can have uh, feces pass out through there you can also have a passage from the colon to the, the bladder called colovesical and that was what our question was on so this person had a history of diverticular disease and had recurrent uti obviously because you're passing feces and microbes into the bladder where they're not supposed to be. And they also um, had what they described as really bubbly urine. So some of you will think bubbly urine is uh, like protein in the urine. It's here, you know, alongside the UTIs and, and, and the history of diverticular disease, you want to think that it was a colobesical fistula. And, and these fistulae obviously warrant surgery because you, you can't manage them, them medically. They need to be closed up and removed and what have you. Um, so you can kind of chop out the disease bowel and, and reconnect the other ends. I've got this little colourful note on the right. The colours, the, the yellow and the blue kind of relate to the other yellow and blue text on the page. Um, so this was just an intended learning outcome on the curriculum map, so I've included it. Obviously, any surgery, you can have pain, infection and blood loss. Um, you can have an anastomotic leak. So if you chop out a section of bowel and reconnect the two ends, Usually five to seven days later is like the classical time frame. The patient can become per peritonitic, can have pain, basically become really unwell. And the key thing in the history is that they've had uh, GI surgery several days previously. So that's one complication. Another one is a colostomy bag. So we'll get onto Hartman's shortly. Basically, if you chop out a section of bowel and don't reconnect the two loose ends, you close one up and form what you call a stump. Uh, so that's the distal end and the proximal end you bring it out to the skin um, and form a stoma the person's gonna have to live with that it's a really significant change and it can impact on quality of life um, so let's move on we've got the key points for diverticular disease so you want to think of it when you have an older patient change in bowel habit pr bleed and left-sided lower abdominal pain if they're feverish you think you may be diverticulitis rather than diverticular disease so the disease has complications and the way you manage the disease has complications. It can cause bowel obstruction, it can perforate and cause sepsis, peritonitis, it can fistulate um, and, you know, as we saw, cause things like UTIs. Um, and you manage that with emergency surgery or non-emergency surgery as we'll get onto and you can give a colostomy bag. Contrast CT is your gold standard investigation. I'd say that's worth definitely memorising. And the management, um, it depends, as we've said, whether it's severe or mild, you know, whether in the community or in hospital and whether there are complications. But uh, you want to hydrate the patient, you want to give antibiotics, you want to give surgery as per complications. So yeah, the next slide we've got is some different bowel resections. So they can be a bit confusing. We'll go through a Hartman's procedure on the left first, that's called a proctosigmoidectomy. So what you can see there is that, so in this case, they've done it for cancer, but you can do it for diverticular disease as well. They've chopped out the diseased section of bowel and rather than joining the two up because I think the anastomosis would fail due to the infl like inflammation there, you have to do a delayed anastomosis if you're going to do it. So you have to kind of chop out the diseased part, wait a little while for inflammation to go away and then you can reconnect them. So you can see what I was talking about, the stump and a colostomy. I haven't got a slide on this, but I've got one eye on the chat. Um, 
Does anyone know the difference between a small bowel or an ileostomy and a colostomy, kind of what you look for? There are two things. So an ileostomy is the same thing. You bring the small bowel out to the wall of the abdomen and you pass feces into a bag. Um, the spouted in ileostomy, yeah, and liquid. And classically, where would you find either of them? Yeah, so, so an ileostomy is um, you bring in the small bowel out to the wall and you spout it because it, the stuff it's passing is, is closer to the stomach, it's more acidic and it's an irritant. So you want it kind of off the skin. So it's going to be on the right side of the tummy and coming right out of the abdominal wall. That's probably an ileostomy. Whereas a colostomy, by the time feces has gotten there, it's less irritant. So you can bring it closer to the, to the abdominal wall and it'll probably be on the left side. But yeah, that's enough about Hartman's procedures, I think. The other ones to know about, if we look at the top left box, we've got anterior resections. You don't need to know the difference between a low and a high anterior resection. What you need to know is that a rectal mass that's over eight centimeters from the anus goes for anterior resection. Eight centimeters is like you cut off. If it's less than eight centimeters, i.e. it's low down, close to your bum, you go for AP resection or abdominal perineal resection. So those are the two things to know for rectal mass. The top boxes at the right, you've got a uh, left hemicolectomy for left-sided mass, right hemicolectomy for right-sided mass. That's fairly intuitive. And then the rest, um, probably post graph they're, they're a bit niche and you can learn about them if you want. I think that's fairly low yield as far as we're concerned. So we'll move on to a different topic. Let me restart the poll for you. Okay, I'm going to close it there. Before I show you all the answers, um, it, the answer is C, but before I show you the answer slide, what, uh, what has this person got before I give it away? Hemorrhoids. Yeah, exactly. So this is um, a hemorrhoid that can be managed conservatively, or at least initially you want to manage conservatively. So you want to increase your fluid and fibre intake to ensure that you kind of being less constipated and you're passing feces through but it's worth noting that that approach takes weeks to act but yeah let's go through this so notably this is a painless rectal bleed so hemorrhoids tend to be um she's been moving boxes at home so raised intra-abdominal pressure is a risk factor because hemorrhoids are kind of they're formed from outpouchings of, of venous cushions in the bum um, and they can form under high pressure so those venous cushions are there to help maintain um continence and with enough force, they can be pushed out. So you can have an internal hemorrhoid or an external one. You can see this woman's got an external one because there's a lesion visible adjacent to the anal canal. Um, if we look up topical ice pack and lidocaine, surgical removal, they're also managing options, but not for this patient. So let's get on and see the next patient. Let me start the poll for you. Okay. Again, um, two thirds of people have, have gone for the correct answer. Someone want to send into the chat um, what's happened here? Yeah, thrombose. So someone's unmuted themselves. So 
So as I said, um, hemorrhoids are venous cushions and any venous structure can thrombose, i.e. have um, stasis of blood flow. Over two day duration, so conservative management, um, potentially, if that's correct, then, then you know more than I do. But what I'm getting at is, um, this is this is now a painful hemorrhoid and it's purple. So you think that there is a thrombosis in the venous cushion that is visible next to the anal canal. And you can go for conservative measures of this at first. So ice pack, just to kind of relieve the pain and lidocaine is a, is a local anesthetic that you can apply topically. Um, if that, if, if it's refractory to that, so if you know, you, you do these things and they don't help or you, you have it for a while, you can go for hemorrhoidectomy where you just chop it out. Okay. We've got one more question in this section before we'll go through some info. And we had a question in one of our exams about thrombosed hemorrhoids, which is why I threw it in. I do think it's a bit of a niche presentation, but. I'm expecting a bit of a split with this one. I've been deliberately a bit tricky with it. Okay, this is being rather pedantic and it might um, annoy some of you because I think whenever you see incision and drainage is probably the correct option. Um, that's the correct management for a pylonidal abscess. What I was getting here was a pylonidal cyst. So the pylonidal disease um, is a bit of a spectrum. It's basically disease of the skin in the natal cleft, which is uh, also known as the, your bum crack. So this guy's got chronic discharge and that can reflect kind of the inflammatory processes going on here. So it starts with inflammation of the hair follicle. So it says that this guy um, previously had a boil. So that was when it first started. Um, on the second, start of the second paragraph, it says he's very hirsute. That just means he's very hairy. Um, and there's a non-tender midline swelling. So it's pedantic. In my mind, if we're going down pylonidal abscess, it'd probably be tender rather than non-tender, and it'd describe him as feeling systemically unwell, because abscesses tend to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, you get a pylonidal sinus, which is where you have a kind of a passage down in the skin, where you have this process. And then if you get a walled off collection of fluid in there, you have a cyst. And then if that gets infected, you have an abscess. And so an abscess is incised and drained, whereas a pylonidal cyst, um, you try to excise and close it. So it's way easier to remove it all um, if you kind of chop it out rather than just going through the wall and, and draining it. Um, a bit of a niche point, but I think the, it is, it's more valuable to bring your attention to the difference between sinus, cyst and abscess than specifically pylonidal diseases. Because um, you could argue this is an abscess and it could present the same way, but I've just been a bit pernickety. So we'll move on. Anorectal disease, um, these can get confusing. So hemorrhoid, we've talked about and we'll come back to, we've got an info slide for each of these. Um, a fistula in ano, so that's something that you, you might see in Crohn's disease. A fissure in ano and anorectal abscess. Um, these ones have got a red line around them because they can present with PR bleeding, whereas pylonidal disease would be, uh, it'd be unusual for, the, for it to do that. So the first info slide we're going on to is hemorrhoids or piles from, from pillow. So spongy tissue that help maintain continence, um, they can bleed and they can cause itching. They're unlikely to, or they're more likely to be painful if they're thrombosed, in which case you'd see, uh, you might see a purple palpable lump. You might not see it, it might be palpable on the inside. Um, and they're still, because, because the source of bleeding is so close to the anus itself, it's gonna be fresh blood. Um, it might be around the bum or on, or on your stools. And so you can diagnose it clinically, but 
you want to err on the side of caution when you have PR bleeding in an older patient. So you can go for colonoscopy, just have a, a look inside. And it's more to exclude important differentials like cancer than it is to diagnose this itself. Um, so it, it's good to go down the, the treatment kind of hierarchy. Conservative, we want to increase the quality of feces that's passing through. So we've talked about constipation as kind of worsening this. If you can alleviate constipation, hopefully you can um, alleviate this. I've mentioned there ispagula husk, ispagula, I don't know how to pronounce it, kind of counterintuitively that's a bulk forming laxative, so it'll help faeces pass through by kind of bulking it up. You might think if, if you're bulking it up you're not going to make it worse when that passes through and by the hemorrhoids, but apparently you know, if you just solve the problem by using that uh, it can help. So let's say that doesn't work, you can go on to medical management, the point of that is to kind of alleviate symptoms. So topical steroids are really good for the itching symptom that you can get and topical anesthetic is good for the pain that you can get. And then you want to go for kind of mechanical measures or, or non-pharmacological uh, measures. So you can, if you have an external hemorrhoid, you can just put a rubber band around it and kind of cut off its blood supply and kill it off. Um, sclerotherapy and, and photocoagulation I'm not going to talk about them. I think you can know that they exist, but the indications for them uh, is a bit niche. And then hemorrhoidectomy, that's what I talked about. If the hemorrhoid is thrombosed, i.e. it's purple, painful, hard, uh, the best thing to do if um, conservative measures fail is to chop it out. So that's hemorrhoids. Um, I've got a lovely picture for you on the next slide. This is a fissure, also known as kind of a tear. So constipation, again, is a risk factor for this. Um, basically, will a hemorrhoid just fall off if you band it? Yeah, anything will fall off. So I don't know if you've seen a skin tag before. It's basically a benign little growth of skin that could, almost hangs off. You can put a band around that and it falls off. Um, I've never seen it done myself, so I, I don't know. I guess it's a mystery what happens. Maybe it kind of grows wings and flies away, but it, it will come off, I think. Um, so yeah, fissure and anus, so a, a tear in the anus. A risk factor for this is, is hard stool and constipation, as we saw before, because that stuff, if you've got big, firm stools, they can traumatise the mucosa here as they pass, pass through. Um, and this is painful. Obviously, you know, it looks quite painful and it can cause bleeding from the site itself. So this is going to be, again, fresh blood because you, you're right at the anus here. And you can have a sentinel skin tag. I haven't got a picture of that, but it's, it's like a weird little uh, sort of ball of skin that kind of hangs off. I don't know why that grows in association with this, but it can happen. You don't need to investigate this. Again, you know, if you have PR bleeding in an older person, maybe you want to err on the side of caution. But as far as diagnosing this is concerned, you can just have a look and, and, and be sure of your diagnosis. So the conservative measures are the same as those for hemorrhoids. You want to increase the quality of feces, so fluid and fibre. Um, the goal of medical management here is slightly different, so it's to in improve the healing process. So that's where topical GTN comes in. You guys will know that's a vasodilator, and if you apply that, you can kind of open up the vessels to the affected area and hopefully promote healing. Now, if that doesn't work, there's a procedure called a sphincterotomy where I think you would be unable to close a tear like that itself. You kind of you cut and make an even bigger tear um, but one that favours healing, so you, you close that immediately. So that's an option. Um, the next bit of bum disease that we want to go on to is fistulas and abscesses. So these don't just occur in Crohn's, but as far as you guys are concerned, I, I want you to think of them as Crohn's complications. Um, so fistula, as we've seen, is a joining between two, uh, two membranes. So you guys will have seen AV fistulae maybe in your vascular week, that's where you join an artery in a vein. Here, fistula in, in ano, that's where you're joining the, mem uh, the mucosa of the rectum or the anus to the uh, outside world, basically. And the risk factors for fissures and hemorrhoids, just constipation. So for fissure, I would say, yeah. For hemorrhoids, remember we also talked about um, heavy lifting, raised intra-abdominal pressure. Um, you probably don't need to think about it anymore. So yeah, fistula, it, we've talked about, that's a tract that forms between two sites that shouldn't form. And an abscess is can form in a fistula and it's going to be a walled off infected collection of pus and fluid and crap. 
Um, so they would present with pain and discomfort, obviously an inflammatory process. Um, anything that comes out can irritate the skin locally. They can cause bleeding, I think, just due to breakdown of the, the mucosa in the local area. And if you have an abscess, this is similar to what I was getting at with pyelonidal disease. You'll see a local swelling and it'll be painful and you can become feverish from it. Again, you can diagnose clinically um, if you're good, if not, ultrasound and, and MRI. You can memorize these if you want. If you don't want to, I think you'll probably get away with it. So the management, um, you can see I've got these blue arrows here. Um, we're linking Crohn's and antibiotics and metronidazole. I think that's really worth memorizing. So metronidazole is the drug of choice for anal disease and Crohn's. And I've got a question there. Why do NICE say you don't want to give metronidazole for bum disease for more than one month? See if anyone knows. It's quite niche. Um, you can potentially figure it out if you know a bit about metronidazole. Side effects, yeah. So there's a particular one that NICE uh, want to avoid. Long QT, I've done if Metro does that, I think you're getting confused with macrolides like erythromycin, clarithromycin. C uh, peripheral neuropathy, so C. diff, it can do that as well, but peripheral neuropathy is the one they say, so you can get, um, I don't know if I'm going to get this wrong, you can get kind of uh, asymmetrical um, kind of anesthesia or loss of motor function kind of in the, in the arms and legs with prolonged use apparently, so that's why you don't want to use metronidazole for too long. But yeah, if you have a fistula, that's the first thing you go to is metro. You can also put a seat on suture in. So you can see that in the bottom left of the diagram. And that just helps to keep the passage open and facilitates drainage, I think. Because um, if you facilitate drainage, you can potentially allow it to kind of heal itself up. Um, if not, fistulotomy and excision. So fistulotomy, I, I don't have a point that I can show you guys, but all the tissue that is between the fistula and the bum you can kind of chop it out so you don't have a tract suddenly you just have a basically a big cavity and that will def like definitely sort out the infection because you're opening it up to the world you can keep it clean you can do topical therapies and you can sort it out that way and then i think you can potentially do surgery to repair that afterwards um if you have an abscess antibiotics incision and drainage i'm not going to label that again the last one we're going to talk about, so pyelonidal disease. So this is where you have um, inflammation of hair follicles um, in and around your bum crack. You can have a sinus, which is kind of a, a blind end that forms. That can wall off into a fluid collection, which is a cyst. If that gets infected, you have an abscess. Again, you can diagnose clinically. And this presents, um, you, you might get a swelling like this guy has here. Um, our patient in the, in the question had uh, offensive smelling discharge, so pus and blood, which are byproducts of the inflammatory process going on. And it can be generally um, uncomfortable. Conservative management for this, or kind of all the management, revolves around keeping the area clean and free of microbes and just kind of waiting for it to heal itself. So clean the area. If you're really hairy down there, you can kind of uh, you can get rid of that. Um, antibiotics if it's infected. Excision and closure for a cyst, incision and drainage for an abscess. So let's have a quick recap because they're kind of similar overlapping conditions. What does the word pyelonidal refer to? Um, I don't know the etymology of it, but when you see pyelonidal, just think, uh, just think bum crack, I guess. Maybe someone can, can look it up. So yeah, this is our summary slide. So hemorrhoid is a painless PR bleed. You might see swelling around the anus, or you might feel a swelling on digital rectal exam. It'll be painful uh, if it's thrombosed. So you want to improve the uh, stool quality and you can manage medically and surgically if you need to. An anal fissure um, is a tear in the wall of the bum or rectum and is caused by constipation with hard, big stools passing through. Again, you want to ensure you've got good feces passing through. You can apply a vasodilator to try and facilitate healing. If not, you can go for sphincterotomy. Fissure and abscess, mm, almost synonymous with Crohn's disease as far as we're concerned. Treat with metronidazole. You can give, uh, you can offer surgical management if, if it's resistant to metro. And pyelonidal disease or disease of the bum crack, you have uh, sinus, then cyst, then abscess. Um, and it'll, the patient will be a, a hairy guy, basically, who doesn't wash his bum. Um, so we'll move on from anorectal diseases. This is the last topic. Um, I understand I've been a bit slow through all of that because I really want to labour uh, the differences between them because I think it's worth it because you don't really get taught elsewhere but we'll speed on a little bit through this stuff now.
Okay. Um, most people have, have gotten the correct answer. What I was thinking was tinkling bowel sounds, kind of classical examination finding in bowel obstruction. Um, oh, I forgot to highlight the vignette, but this guy's got acute pain, distension. Um, he's not passing much um, out the back end and he's got an empty rectum on PR. So all things point towards bowel obstruction. Um, we'll go through the other options. Normal bowel sounds are normal. Absent bowel sounds, um, can anyone put into the chat? In fact, you, you guys tell me, where would you hear absent bowel sounds, hyperactive bowel sounds and reduced ones? So ileus, yeah, exactly. Why does he have increased frequency of defecation? So that was previously, he's basically, he's had a change in bowel habit. So when you see an older guy with change in bowel habit, you're thinking diverticular disease or cancer. It's, it's not so much whether it's uh, increase or decrease, it's the fact that there's a change and now he's constipated and, and obstructed. Um, there's not too much value in, in looking at whether it's up or down, kind of the output. Yeah, so someone's put ileus. So if you have no bowel sounds whatsoever, it's unusual to get that in kind of a mechanical obstruction. That's usually ileus, which we'll come back to, which is where someone has surgery, like abdominal surgery, and the, the, the bowel, although it's healthy, just kind of stops moving for a period of days, and there's just no sounds. Hyperactive, that's um, when you've got like diarrhea, um, with the bowels kind of working overtime and reduced bowel sounds, I think that's just um, maybe in an obese person when it's harder to hear because you've got other things in the way. So we will move on to another SBA. And this is a bit of a cheeky question, um, which I've done deliberately. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. So we've interestingly got a bit of a spread. Um, the most popular answer was abdominal x-ray, and I think that's the correct one. Let's talk about the other ones. So abdominal x-ray and chest x-ray and CT, they all have a place in, in bowel obstruction. So this, this again, um, this, is, this is bowel obstruction. Abdominal x-ray is what you use to more definitively diagnose it. So while you can make a clinical diagnosis, um, it's all about kind of accruing evidence in favor of one theory over another. So abdominal x-ray will show kind of fecal impaction and will show uh, bowel distension. So that diagnoses obstruction. Um, chest x-ray, can anyone tell us why you would do a chest x-ray in bowel obstruction? Air under the diaphragm, yeah. So pneumoperitoneum. So if you have air, if you have a perforation in the bowel wall, air will move up to the top of the abdomen, will sit under the diaphragm, and it's too high up for an abdominal x-ray to pick it up, so you need to get chest x-ray for that purpose. And I didn't put here, it needs to be an erect chest x-ray, so they need to be sat upright. Um, doesn't have to x-ray only pick up 50% of obstructions? Yeah, potentially, but maybe it kind of it's in the wording of the question. You would never CT someone just because they had obstruction or just because you were trying to diagnose obstruction. Um, so, you know, before you do this investigation, it's not, the obstruction is not diagnosed. So CT would be better, but like, good luck working um, as a junior doctor and, and ordering a CT because you're querying bowel obstruction. Like the radiology will always come back and say, no, do, do an abdominal x-ray. But I've put CT in because once you have a confirmed um, obstruction, if you're trying to figure out what the cause is, like if you suspect there's cancer or something, then CT is better. Um, but at this point, you basically you need to do your x-rays before you do your CT. Otherwise, if you're giving out unnecessary CTs, kind of the radiation dosages that you're giving out to the population are a bit unnecessary. We've got one last vanilla but um, important question. I think this probably comes up every year because this is like 
classic foundation year one fodder um, and it's important. And this is unfortunately the last SBA of the session before we just talk a little bit about bowel obstruction. Um, but it's just past seven, so you'll be glad to finish soon, I'm sure. Okay, I'm going to pause it there. Um, so let's talk about the answers. Someone has gone for A, IV fluids and antibiotics and high flow oxygen. That's part of the sepsis six. And there's not much here saying that she's septic at the moment. Laparotomy, that is a bit severe. So that's for anyone who, who doesn't know what that term means. That's basically a big midline incision in the abdomen. There's no reason why you'd want to do that yet. Um, a lot of you have gone for C, so nil by mouth, IV fluids and a nasogastric tube. So that's all, those are all treatments that can be given kind of very safely, i.e. can be given by an F1. And these are measures that buy you time when you think that someone has bowel obstruction. So basically, nil by mouth stops things going in and kind of worsening the obstruction. IV fluids ensure that while the person's got no oral intake, they're still hydrated. And a nasogastric tube um, helps to drain fluid from the stomach, which is naturally produced by, by the stomach, like acids and what have you, which, if they were to collect, might make the obstruction worse. Someone's gone for induction of general anesthesia. Um, I don't even know why I've put that as an option. That's a bit of a rogue one, so you can, just, you can ignore that. Um, so, yeah, the answer is C, call it drip and suck. Um, so yeah, let's go on. So when you have bowel obstruction, you've got small bowel and large bowel, and it's kind of up to you to try and figure out which one it is. Essentially, small bowel is what you hope for because you can it's easier to manage and it might reverse itself. Large bowel obstruction, um, the causes are more sinister, and those patients are probably going to need to go for surgery. So how, how they, they present kind of some ways the same and in, in some ways different. So vomiting, anorexia, um, anorexia meaning they can't eat, they can get they get nausea and constipation, they can be distended, so they'll be full of, of air and, and feces, um, and they can have tinkling bowel sounds. Now they, they can be a bit of um, chronology in the presentation. So if someone has a small bowel obstruction, the obstruction is closer to the top end. So they might vomit earlier in the presentation and become constipated later on. Whereas if the obstruction is in the large bowel, they might become constipated first and vomit later on because you need to get a, a backlog, which takes longer to develop. There's some value in considering that in, in what comes first, but I don't know how sensitive and specific those things are. So bear them in mind, but don't kind of really look out for them in, in, a, in a vignette. Um, so, but, but yeah, you basically, you need an, an x-ray to, to help distinguish between the two. And we've got some abdominal x-rays afterwards and there's some signs you can look for. Um, is the obstruction partial or complete? If there's a complete obstruction, you're either thinking it's ileus and it's all right, or it's a complete obstruction with a mechanical cause. And um, you kind of, you're very worried at that point because that's high risk of, of perforation, what have you. So we've got these highlighted causes here. The vast, vast, vast majority of, of bowel obstructions are caused by adhesions. So they're kind of, they're like sticky spider webs that form inside the abdomen and the patient will always have a history of surgery. Um, so that's kind of the commonest small bowel cause. The commonest large bowel cause is unfortunately cancer. And then ileus, I've mentioned there, they will always have a history of recent surgery, recent being in the past few days or week. Um, and I've highlighted volvulus there as well. It's a good exam topic. I don't know how common it is um, in real life. How far back in the history would you look for surgery? So for adhesions, you might be looking like months back, decades, years or decades. For ileus, you'll be looking back days. Um, so let's have a look. I've said that x-ray is really useful for distinguishing between small and large bowel. 
these are the two. So the key things that you can see here in the small bowel X-ray, um, you can see dilated bowels kind of more in the centre of the of the abdomen, whereas in the large bowel obstruction, you can see kind of the more a bit more off to the side. But that's not that useful. What is more useful is looking for valvuli coniventes and haustra. So you might remember these terms vaguely from from pre pre -clins. You can see valvuli coniventes span the entire width of the bowel, and that's what you see in the small bowel. Whereas haustra kind of only come in a little bit, and I've coloured in a few of them to highlight that. Um, someone's asked what's intersusception. <laughs> if you look on Google Images, it will tell you a lot better than than I will. Basically, the bowel telescopes into itself. Um, I'm not really sure why. It's a bit of a weird presentation. I think it's commoner in paediatrics, so you'll definitely cover it fifth year if you don't this year. Um, and it can occur at the ileocecal junction where the, the uh, I think the ileum is smaller than the cecum. Um, and so it's, it's naturally kind of more prone to, to going inside. And the way you manage intersusception is to kind of put air up the back passage and hope that it kind of sorts it out that way. It's called air insufflation. But yeah, this is abdominal x-ray for small versus large bowel. Look out for the, the key thing is to look for the lines across the bowel. And then a couple of others. This is what pneumoperitoneum looks like. And we had this in our OSCE. We had an OSCE station where this woman had shoulder pain, was smashing NSAIDs, and then had peritonitis, uh, raised inflammatory markers, and she had an X-ray that looked like this. Um, so the key thing that you really want to note there is under the right hemidiaphragm, there's air, which should never ever be there. Um, and that is an indication for surgery because it, it shows you there's a hole in the wall of the bowel that's going to need surgical repair. And on the right, I think CTs are a bit tough, so I don't know if you'd have to interpret one, but it's useful for showing uh, what a strangulated hernia looks like. So I've not gone into hernias too much, but they're kind of outpouching of the bowel through the abdominal wall. And strangulated means that kind of it's gone out through this hole in the abdominal wall and it can't come back in. And the, the abdominal wall is kind of choking it off and it's cut off its blood supply and that's going to need emergency surgery. Um, that can kill off the part of the bowel that's trapped, in which case you need to resect it. Um, if you get there in time, you might not have to. So that's an important, um, I think, uncommon but emergency cause of bowel obstruction. Um, so let's get on to how you manage it. It kind of, it depends on the cause. Um, drip and suck is what the F1 will initiate, and you can do an abdominal X-ray to diagnose obstruction itself. And you can put a catheter in just to help monitor fluid output. So these are all things, kind of th this stuff becomes second nature by the time you finish final year. And it's the stuff you do in F1. And you can do all of this yourself. Um, all the management thereafter needs to be decided by um, a senior. So that's whether you go for CT to try and figure out what's causing the obstruction. That's whether you go for surgery or don't go for surgery. Um, so let's look at the, the management at the bottom. Things that don't need surgery, which is most cases of small bowel obstruction if you think it's small bowel you kind of you wait 24 hours because it might unobstruct itself um so that's like adhesions doing it and if you've waited and it's not getting better you can go in and kind of cut away at the adhesions and release the bowel that way things that do need surgery tend to be mostly large bowel stuff you can have herniation and a strangulation of a hernia of the small bowel that'll need surgery as we talked about and then you can see these other things, diverticular disease, colorectal cancer and volvulus, the more kind of large bowel causes and they will need uh, surgical management. So this is the last bit of info I've got for you guys before we all part ways. Bowel obstruction presents with uh, nausea, vomiting, constipation, distension, pain, all fairly intuitive things. Um, if, it's, if you're suspecting small bowel, they might vomit and then become constipated and you're thinking adhesions. If it's large bowel, they might become constipated and then vomit and you're thinking cancer. You need to do um, an X, abdominal x-ray to diagnose it. If you suspect pneumoperitoneum, i.e. peritonitis, a rigid abdomen or a woody abdomen, you need to go for chest x-ray to look for pneumoperitoneum, air under the diaphragm. If you've diagnosed uh, bowel obstruction and you're not sure what's causing it, then CT is the investigation of choice. So what you as an F1 do, put them on nil by mouth, IV fluids, um, I should have put NG tube there as well, um, and then get basically tell your senior what's going on, and they'll say, okay, we'll give it 24 hours, see if it sorts itself out, 
that's if it's small bowel if it's large bowel um you don't wait 24 hours you, you act in accordance with what the senior says um so unfortunately that is that if we've got any questions i will hang around to answer them um otherwise thanks a lot for coming you've all enjoyed a good sort of hour and a half maybe more of kind of bowel disease and bum disease um hopefully it's been insightful could you please send us the msc questions yeah thanks for reminding me so when we finish this session i'll do that um i think we've got questions and answer ones so it'd be quite useful revision for you guys um, yeah oh yeah that's a good point if you guys can be bothered to send us feedback then please do if not, uh, fair enough. So I'll send a link for those of you who can be asked. I really rated the the piles word origin. I did not know that. That's probably the best thing I've learned in six years. <laughs> Pillar. Um, any questions about bum disease? I'm going to stop recording there. Haven't we got any questions?